She's you the guys, one who does it. Does you've you know? never, ever heard of Fred William Bowerman. No, obviously not, no. no. He was in the Christopher Guest movies. That's Fred Willard. Good guess. Uh, I haven't. Oh, good don't, guess. don't you love everything he's Fred in? Willard's, Fred Willard. He's another season. one who's, who is who he is in all the movies. And oh, yeah, like, yeah, like yeah, yeah. It's true. And you're happy about it. You're like, hey, it's Fred Willard. Yeah, you know what to expect. Fred William Bowerman was an American bank robber and Depression era outlaw. He has been described as a veteran holdup man. His criminal career lasted about 20 years. Nearing 60 years of age, Bowerman was named number 46 by the FBI, landing himself on the FBI's 10 most wanted list in 1953. Damn. His last year alive, which I think is kind of a good goal. Like you make it on that list and then you can just die. Because you're gonna. Yeah. Because <laughs> everyone's coming up it. there. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like being diagnosed with cancer at that point. You're like, well, guys, I'm top 10. Yeah. Here we are. I made it. There really isn't much on the early life of Fred William Bowerman. He was born in 1893 in Pipestone Township in Michigan, and his criminal career began in the 1930s. His first arrest was in Illinois for armed robbery in 1932. Damn. Hell, hell of a first arrest. Yeah. So he served five years and was paroled in 1937. And didn't learn, didn't learn his lesson. Immediately began committing robberies throughout the Chicago area. Like immediately, like he walked out into yeah. a store and robbed stuff. Pretty much. <laughs> um, he was doing all these uh, robberies in Chicago, but he was still currently living in Michigan. And he would drive to Chicago using stolen cars. He would just like steal cars, <laughs> he was drive to Chicago. To work. <laughs> yeah. And then what? I guess it's steal another car and drive back. <laughs> what, what year is this? Um, he, so he was first arrested in 1932. He was paroled in 1937. He committed 36 robberies between June and October in 1938. So just between those two, uh, yeah, June and October, 36 robberies. He was captured within a year and he was sentenced to Juliet prison where he spent another seven more years locked up for his crimes. So he was, uh, he spent seven years. He was locked up again in 1939. He spent seven more years in jail. So Jesus. at this point, he's done like 12 years of jail. Jesus. And he's in his 30s now? So he was born in 1893, and this is 1946, and I can't do math. No, He'd that's... been around the sun a few times. After his release in 1946, Bowerman finally learned a lesson. He kept a low profile. But he was eventually identified as one of the several men who robbed a bank in South Bend, Indiana. For $53,000 since September of 1952. Jesus. I don't know what Christ. that would be now, but that's a lot of money for Seems 1952. Like a right. That's a lot of money for now. You get a steak for a nickel and like a banana for like a quarter. But yeah, wait, wait, still- wait, bananas are worse than <laughs> steaks. <laughs> oh, I didn't really get a lot of banana information on this story. I apologize. <laughs> <But yeah. laughs> what are you doing? You still can't get McDonald's, I didn't really know right? what the banana the industry is. The price of inflation is. on bananas yeah. during the whatever, know. 1950, whatever. I didn't like Google. Banana inflation. Fred William net. Bowerman and bananas. Banana prices, <laughs> banana <laughs> index. <laughs> so this robbery was um, actually attracted national attention because a bank employee was shot for raising his hands too slowly. <laughs> oh, son of a bitch. Yeah, so there you go. A little over a month after this incident, Bowerman participated in one of the most violent bank heists in American history. He signed up for it. He volunteered. He, he volunteered. Yeah. He, he actually kind of organized this. All right. Um, with three other men, Frank Vito, Glenn Chernick, and William Scholl. Scholl, Vito, and Chernick were from Chicago, and Bowerman was from Niles, Michigan. Scholl was 26, and he was the only one of the four with a clean record. A disabled army veteran from World War II and a bartender in Chicago, he had met Bowerman in the tavern and became part of the gang on Bowerman's promise that he'd make $5,000 in five minutes. So that was Bowerman's like spiel to give everybody like, you're going to get $5,000 in five minutes. The elevator yeah. pitch. I, I, I'm down now. It's an yeah. elevator pitch. On the afternoon of April 24th, 1953, at 10.19 a.m., three masked men entered the Southwest Bank in South St. Louis, Missouri, and attempted to hold up the bank. Each robber carried two pistols, and Bowerman himself carried a sawed-off shotgun. Swinging that sawed-off shotgun, ringleader Fred Bowerman jumped onto a counter and shouted, This is a holdup! Everybody stand still! The robbery started out as planned. They knew their target well. The neighborhood bank had almost about $200,000 ready for cash and paychecks. The men quickly gathered up around $140,000 from the bank teller's cages and prepared to carry them out in a nylon satchel. However, unknown to any of the men, bank teller Alice Rudzica had set off a silent alarm, the first of several. 
As the robbers were about to make their escape, a number of police officers arrived and surrounded the bank. As the robbers began firing at police through the windows, Jesus Christ. the bank employees hid in the vault to escape the firefight and tear gas thrown into the building. So not only did they know exactly where to go to get all of this money, when the silent alarm was triggered, which they probably knew might have happened, they immediately opened fire? No, it wasn't until the cops started to arrive. So, Because it was a silent alarm? So, um, which is something that's kind of interesting is there was this um, photographer named Jack January, which I don't even know if that's Jack such a tight name. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that a tight name. Yeah, that's a tight name. Wherever he was, he'd heard the radio broadcast or the police signal, um, and he was uh, able to get to the shootout and get, like, close-up photos of the action at the bank because he, like, drove behind a police car from downtown at, like, of 70 miles per hour to reach the scene. Of like, course he did. Like, how gangstery is that? That's how... Uh, there's, a, there's a really well-known New York City photographer who would who would li- who would would go into police stations late at night and would listen to the old radio. Yeah. So he was probably, you know, one yeah, of those probably just ambulance listening. chasers. Mm-hmm. Basically, yeah. Eventually, the robbers ran out of time and ammo, finding themselves trapped. Bowerman's remaining partners panicked. Police officers Melbourne Stein and Robert Heights... Melbourne Stein. Melbourne Stein. They were patrolling like two blocks away. They were the first officers to respond. Stein took the front door and Heights went through the side entrance. Heights exchanged pistol shots with the robbers and was wounded by a blast from Bowerman's shotgun. Bowerman got it. Got he got it. him. He got an yeah. injury. Knowing that he was totally screwed... Bowerman took bank customer Eva Hamilton hostage oh, no. and held a shotgun on her as he attempted to escape. I'm thinking in my head that sawed off shotgun. Nobody move or the team yeah. gets it. Oh, Jesus. So he's basically using her as a human shield. And he like kind of went outside and was like, nobody move. I'll shoot her. Um, and he like shoved her on the pavement and broke both of her wrists. Damn. Bowerman was shot in the chest by Melbourne Good. Stein and the bullet pierced a lung and launched his spine. Eva Hamilton mm. was fine aside from her broken wrists. Yeah. He must have been paralyzed. Oh, yeah. It totally fucked him up. Also, when they realized that they were trapped, Bowerman had orders the accomplices to grab a woman. You know, like he did. I mean, why not? Just grab a woman. It worked the first time. So one of the... Uh, grab they, a woman, throw her on throw the ground, her and then let someone shoot you. And then let someone shoot you. <laughs> yeah. And that's how it we'll get out great. of this, boys. I know this is going to sound crazy. Just do it. <laughs> Somehow you win. So one of the accomplices, Shoal, he picked this lady, Mrs. Cantino, but he let her go when she began crying that she was a mother. When he heard her adorable last name, yeah. Cantino. Mrs. Cantino. So um, he had a, he was actually married. He had kids. So I think the fact that this woman was like, don't shoot me, I'm a mother. Like, he was like, ah, all right. And like, kind of just like tossed her whole side. Like, None of these dudes. <laughs> <laughs> uh. um, he actually attempted to go for a backup weapon, but by the time police came in they disarmed him um he suffered a wound on his back in a gunfight and he surrendered in the bank he cried when a st louis circuit court jury found him guilty he cried in court yeah and he was sentenced to 25 years frank b Vito. he was 25 he was (laughs) he was already convicted felon he was on free bond from a liquor store robbery when he took part in southwest bank robbery so he was already like wanted in in that state too probably yes Basically, when they surrounded him, he thought he had actually shot an officer. So when they got to him, he was like, you know what? He looked over to the other guys. He was like, we're going to get 99 years. I can't take a pinch. And he just shot himself in the head right now. Oh, my God. Just go out. Wait, hold on. Like Frank Vito. Frank Vito. This is when they were apprehended? Yeah. So when the cops got in, after they they shot Bowerman. They didn't frisk him? Oh, no. In the bank. In the bank. In the lobby. They came in and he was just like, I think I I I shot one of those cops. So I'm going to get 99 years. And he just like shot himself in the head right there. And then the person right next to him goes, no, no, dude. It's like you heard that, right? (laughs) (laughs) Dude, it's only like 10 to 12. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't shoot no cops. That was him. You're only 25. Oh. That was Danny DeVito's ne- and nephew. Great uncle. <laughs> Frank Vito. Oh. Um, the fourth member of the robbery team um, was Glenn Chernick, and he was a Marquette University college football star. He was 22. He was the getaway driver. Um, he actually fled when police arrived, but... <laughs> Probably the smartest one. Laters. But he was found three days later at his dad's house in Chicago. He was a quarterback for Marquette University, but he was expelled, and he was awaiting trial for theft of wholesale cigarettes. 
So he's like, you know what? I stole some cigarettes. Let's just go straight to robbing straight a to bank. bank yeah. So um, he was also sentenced to 25 years. They could have made a lot of money from those cigarettes. <laughs> Bowerman was uh, taken to a hospital where he tried to identify himself as John W. Frederick. However, FBI used his fingerprints to prove his identity. He never talked with police, and he ended up dying in the hospital. No snitching. No snitching. So he, he used his first name as his last name? Yeah, he just gave him this fake name. Wow, what a genius. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no Master of subterfuge. His name was Fred William Fred William Bowerman, Bowerman, and he told them that he was John W. Frederick. He still kept the W? Wow. <laughs> yeah, well, you he's know. Really, he's really you know, wow. kind of John keep it easy Lynn. to I'll remember. Yeah. John could have gone with a Chad or a Steven. Jesus Christ. Cuck. I'll edit that out. <laughs> More than 40 shots have been exchanged, but none of the customers or employees were injured, thankfully. Aside from poor Eva Hamilton, who oh. broke her wrist. Um, everybody was hiding in, like, the, the all the um, employees were in the basement. So all the cops helped them get out. They When they heard shots upstairs, everyone was, like, wiping their faces from tear gas and everything. Um, the case is regarded as one of St. Louis Police Department's finest moments. So, them. Um, there's actually a movie about this. It is called The Great St. Louis Bank Robbery. Oh. It was made in 1959, so just six years after Damn. the bank Whoa. robbery. It was, that was current as hell for that. Right. Yeah. Um, it was based on the actual holdup of Southwest Bank. Um, it was made on location by producer director Charles Guggenheim. And among the cast was Goog. a new was a known the Goog the Goog, Goog and AKA and the Goog the Goog you know the Goog. by the Goog, Goog. it was a, it yeah, was a it Goog was, it was like Goog's like first movie Goog flicks. another yeah. Goog joint <laughs> Goog flicks um, this was one of Steve McQueen's first movies actually. oh really yeah oh shit um, and remember and it was the Great St Louis the Great St Louis bank robbery okay in 1959 okay. cool and do you remember um. Officer Melbourne Stein, the guy who actually shot Bowerman, yeah. he actually had a small speaking role in the film. He didn't get to him. play himself. Oh, he though? didn't get to play oh, himself. That's a that was portrayed by Crahan Denton. Uh, oh, right. Denton man. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> Denty. Oh, Denty. Oh, Denty. <laughs> but Melbourne Stein actually, um, he retired from the department in 1973, and at age 97, is the oldest living retiree. That is super super cool. Yeah. Of the police department or of all time. You know um, of the Goog of the Googs of the, <laughs> the, the Googs of the 1973 of the Googs. That's crazy. Yes.